Fee is the son of a slaveholder. He's born in Bracken County, Kentucky. Went to seminary and heard the sermons of the famous abolitionist evangelist, Charles Grandison Finney. And he comes back to Kentucky just as young people do when they go to school and he's full of these incredible ideas. And his parents are appalled and they disown him. For John G. Fee, he appeals to higher law, a higher law that recognizes immediately that God is in every person and that slavery has to end right now. Fee's book, An Anti-Slavery Manual, attracted national attention, including emancipationist Kentuckian Cassius Clay, who invited Fee to his home in Madison County so that he could preach his anti-slavery message. And for people who hear this abolitionist gospel, not only preaching freedom, but treating African Americans as social equals, this raises the specter that is the fear of every southern slaveholder, which is an armed slave rebellion. After receiving a gift of 10 acres of land from Cassius Clay, Fee and his wife Matilda organized a small church and school with the help of a group of like-minded men and women. In 1858, the first trustees of the college, which included John G. Fee and John Hanson and J.R. Rogers, among others, gathered in Fee's study to compose the Constitution. In order to promote the cause of Christ, we the undersigned do voluntarily unite ourselves together to establish and maintain an institution of learning. The Constitution also lays out that all persons of good moral character will be eligible for acceptance at the school. And by all persons, that is a very literal statement because what they mean are not only white people, but they mean blacks and women. But then as Fee's reputation grows, there's great concern that his message and his gospel will turn the world upside down. And so it did. Fee was confronted by violent mobs, even dragged from the pulpit on one occasion. Ironic that this small colony of God-fearing, nonviolent educators was the object of such fear and outrage. But this was a time of great upheaval in our country. There's a county meeting at the courthouse. Brash statements are made about running these folks out of town, and then they head down the pike to do that very thing. God's got words for men like Christmas Eve, 1859, the founders and their families enter this period of exile in which they have to wait and see uh, if, they are, if they can return to the dream. When the founders were driven out of Berea, they crossed over into the Ohio River into exile. Even in spite of being driven out, they were ready to come back. When Fee finally returns in 1864, he visits Camp Nelson, one of the largest African-American training facilities for the enlistment of black troops in the Upper South during the Civil War. As the war draws to a close, he invites these soldiers and their families to come to Berea to be part of the community and receive an education. Reborn out of exile and the end of the Civil War, Berea's vision takes shape. Now you have an entire community made up of people, black and white, living next to each other, attending church together and worshiping together, and helping each other. And it's a remarkable experiment. This is what the founders and the early administrators and teachers were able to successfully argue, is that all the presumed social evils of educating these different peoples together just never happened. I think about the nerve, uh, the greatness of Mr. Fay, the founder of this great institution, who had a, who had a concept that equality was correct, that there ought not be distinctions. You have to look back in amazement, 
rid of the white man in the 1870s, you know, having that kind of vision. Fee, Rogers, and the other founders propelled their vision with such velocity, one can still hear their words and feel their spirit in the students and faculty of today's Berea. I consider myself to believe that I can make a difference. Reverend John Greg Fee believed that he could make a difference. That's how Berea got started, and that's what it is now. From the perspective of 21st century America, we can hardly fathom the social and political conflict that preceded the Civil War. We do know, however, that in the midst of that turmoil, the Reverend John Greg Fee and a small community of strong faith followed God's calling and started a school. Their vision, as strong 150 years later as it was when they conceived of it, has evolved into an educational model for the world. Berea College has built a tradition of interracial coeducational education that stands as a testament to the goodness of the human spirit. God has made of one blood all peoples of the earth. Simple principles of human dignity and equality, peace with justice, and love over hate simple principles that have provided a home and a promise of a bright future for students since 1855.